I believe we can all agree that dogs are great animals. Witty, loving, and dependable. There is a reason why dogs, not chickens, are regarded as man's best friend. In addition to the fact that some people can interpret yet another nasty bark as Timmy being trapped in a mine, watching Glassy teaches us that dogs can be courageous as well. Oh, and aside from that odd Mandela effect, Timmy never got stuck down a well in any of the 571 episodes. Whatever the case, it seems sense that the title of the bravest dog in history is highly debated. Despite having numerous rivals for the coveted canine crown, one dog emerged as the clear winner. While other dogs were pleased to quietly sit at home, sleeping in their baskets, this dog led from the front, fighting for his country through the darkest times in our history. Which, I suppose, is fair. In the end, they were dogs. This patriotic dog, served in 17 fights, was granted his own rank in the army, and millions of people still visit him each year, long after he went away. That last sentence may sound unusual, but trust me. Welcome to Sergeant Stubby, the most honorably decorated canine of the First World War and a source of inspiration for both people and animals. It's not unusual to see animals in motion. In 2000 years, war elephants would be wreaking devastation on old battlefields. Since then, various species have engaged in a struggle for the benefit of their masters. There have been a true Noah's Ark of critters in conflict, ranging from camels and pigeons to rats and dolphins. Because of their intellect, disposition, and propensity for obedience, dogs have undoubtedly been the most prominent animals across time. Roman soldiers trained dogs to battle with them. And you probably recall the gladiator opening combat scene where Russell Crowe's dog repels his enemies. Mastiffs were used as war dogs in the Middle Ages to knock knights off their horses. And both Napoleon and Attila the Hun included dogs in their armies. Following their service with British battalions in South Africa during the Boer War, numerous dogs received medals. So there was a lengthy history of dogs being on duty by the time the First World War started in 1914. The early years of Stubb are hardly known. The tenacious Boston Terrier, at five years old, was first discovered in July 1917 wandering through Yale University's grounds. Stubb would hang around as they trained in the Yale Bowl, where the 102nd Infantry, 26th Division was stationed at the time. Because of his short tail, one soldier, a private by the name of James Conroy, developed feelings for this mischievous canine and gave him the name Stubb. Not Conroy's dogs, but the ones that are. Stubb, who had just been given his new name, seemed to be destined for military life because he did the necessary drills and bugle calls alongside the other soldiers. The camp's rules barred animals, but Stubb's boost to morale caused the rules to change. He even mastered the ability to perform a little dog salute by lifting his right paw to his eyebrow when instructed to. The 26th Division was sent to the front line in France after three months of training. Because he wasn't technically permitted to bring his new best friend along, Conroy was now in a difficult situation. But in his opinion, leaving him on campus was simply unacceptable. Stubb accompanied the troops as they traveled by train to a port in Virginia. Conroy then put Stubb beneath his greatcoat and got him on board the SS Minnesota. Fortunately, Stubb was a little terrier and not a strong dame. Conroy placed Stubb in a coal bin once he boarded the ship, which is a degrading way for anybody to cross the Atlantic, let alone a potential military hero. Stubb's fate became uncertain in the middle of his voyage when an officer found him. According to lore the dog charmed the man by giving his signature salute. He was allowed to stay because people were charmed by his canine respect. The crew got fond of this celebrity stowaway as he wandered the ship after emerging from his hiding place. He was deemed the 122nd Division's unofficial mascot because a machinist created him a set of dog tags that were actually made of metal that A.T. St. Nazir on France's western coast, the SS Minnesota made landfall. The troops then proceeded to the Western Front, a 400-mile line of trenches between France and Belgium, along with one dog. Stubb initially played no formal position but assisted Conroy in his many tasks, oftentimes riding beside him as he delivered communications to other command posts. But Stubb didn't start acting like a military dog until February 1918. He and his master were bunkered on the front line, which was heavily shelled by Germans on St. Patrick's Day for the whole day. Stubb was shortly after exposed to poisonous gas and required medical attention at a field hospital. However, this occurrence gave him a canine ability. 
His nose became extremely sensitive to any gas after that, preferably excluding any from his own ass. Stubb performed his first really heroic deed shortly after discovering his newfound olfactory prowess. Stubb smelled the German's gas assault early one morning before his human friends even realized who had done it. In order to rouse the men awake and lead them to safety, he continued to sprint up and down the trench while barking and biting at them. Stubb was promoted to private first class for his valor. Oh, and if you were worried about Stubb's safety while doing his job as a gas detector, do not fret. His comrades had made him a unique gas mask. Stubb cut a unique figure by this point, donning a custom-made chamois coat that adoring local ladies allegedly gave to him. His name was stitched on it, and it housed his ever-expanding collection of medals. Stubb made a remarkable effort to locate injured soldiers in hostile territory. He would listen for English speakers and locate his pals who were in trouble. When the paramedics arrived, he would bound over and stand by them while barking. Back in the trench, Stubb sat next to the injured soldiers, keeping them company and making sure they were secure by staying alert whenever they slept off. Sadly, Stubb suffered a combat injury when shrapnel struck him in the chest and leg following a particularly violent German assault. But a good dog can't be kept in a dugout forever, and after a few months of recuperation, he was back to doing what he did best, instilling the fear of God, or should we say a dog, in the adversary. He could now distinguish between Germans and Americans based on their outfits. Gray was horrible and khaki was wonderful. One day he saw a German spy attempting to map out the Allied trenches while hiding in the bushes. He was indeed correct. He was looking for the enemy's hiding place. He attacked the rebel while charging, biting down and maintaining control until the cavalry came. In this case, infantry. Stubb was promoted to sergeant in recognition of his valiant deed. In addition, the captured German's iron cross was removed and placed on Stubb's coat for him to keep. Stubb hated the Second Reich so much that when prisoners of war were returned to the camp, he had to be restrained so he wouldn't further their plight by biting at their toes. Up to the conclusion of the conflict in November 1980, Stubb remained at the center of the battle. The 102nd had by that point engaged in more combat than any other unit of American soldiers. 210 days altogether. To suggest they must have been exhausted would be an understatement. Hundreds of American, Australian, French, and English soldiers reportedly recognized Stubb when his battalion moved to Paris and were ready to shake his hand. To tremendous jubilation, he even led a victory march around the city. Then, on Christmas Day, he had his first of three encounters with President Woodrow Wilson. Stubb immediately offered the president his paw for a handshake. Evidently, when he was meeting with ward leaders, he abandoned the formality of his customary salute. A little rude Stubb and Conroy were officially demobilized and returned to Massachusetts in April 1919. For Stubb, the battle may have ended, but things had only just begun. He had come to France in 1917 as an unnamed animal and had left a year later as a canine celebrity. He visited veterans' memorials across America while being followed by paparazzi. Shouldn't that be paparazzi instead? I'm sorry, I'll end immediately. Even though he was brilliantly called Sylvester Z. Apolli, our much-lauded mongrel went on to become a vaudeville star, appearing in theaters run by the biggest producer of the day. And he once shared the stage with the most well-known actress of her time, Mary Pickford, dubbed the Queen of Movies. There was no end in sight to Stubb's ever greater adventures, which had made him the most famous animal in America at this point. He attended the Republican National Convention in 1920. The highest-ranking U.S. Army officer, General John Pershing, then presented him with a gold medal at the White House in 1921. James Conroy, the proprietor of Stubbs and the man in the great coat, relocated to Washington, D.C. that same year to attend Georgetown University to study law. Stubb, who was never one to sit still, was chosen as the school's sports mascot. At halftime of football games, he would play with the ball to keep the audience entertained. When not sleeping at the institution, he had access to a variety of other accommodations. Stubb was permitted to spend the night in the Jacob Rothschild-built Majestic Hotel in Central Park, one of the best hotels of the day. I fear to imagine what was charged for room service the next morning. Oh, and the YMCA, which is a great place to stay as we all know, made him a lifetime member. A spot to sleep anytime he desired as well as three bones every day were promised. 
For many years, Stubb relished his famous lifestyle, which included parades, photos, and picnics with plenty of bones. He was given a full amphibiously in the New York Times that opened simply and forcefully, Stubb is dead. He lived to the ripe old age of 13, dying peacefully in his sleep in 1926. But even after his death, good old Stubb kept on serving his country. He was given a full amphibiously in the New York Times that opened simply and forcefully, Stubb is dead. He lived to the ripe old age of 13, dying peacefully in his sleep in 1926. But even after his death, good old Stubb kept on serving his country. In the Smithsonian Museum, where he still resides today, he was taxidermied and dressed in his signature coat and medals. Every year, Stubb is included in a Great War display that attracts millions of tourists. And it's good to know that, more than a century after he shown amazing bravery on the battlefield, people throughout the world are still remembering the canine whose bite was just as terrible as his bark. Also, it has been established that dogs do have shoulders. Good to know. And thanks for watching.